Hey everybody, this is Stephen Coming Out Tarot. If you've been here before, welcome back. If you haven't been here before, welcome. Um, I am getting ready soon, hit dress, <clears throat> getting ready soon to go to mother-in-law's for dinner. It's Thursday, hey CS Stucky. Uh, but I wanted to talk about Rudolph as a coming out story. I think some people have thought of this before, but other people have have maybe never heard it. So I wanted to share the the concept. I think it is, um, I think Rudolph's story uh, is truly a coming out story. And if you don't know the story of Rudolph, uh, when, I, when I say that name, uh, I'm talking about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So we've got this, this fictional character of a reindeer who has a red nose who, uh, is ostracized for how he appears to other people um, and it turns out to be his like superpower that people recognize him for the world over including hey poet including the man who made him famous um, Santa Claus so in this in this story Rudolph is born to um, how are you? Rudolph is born to, uh, I think it's Donner and, is it Donner? Is Donner his dad? Uh, anyway, one of the other reindeer, I think it's Donner. And um, as soon as Rudolph is born, his little nose begins to glow bright red. And his parents decide that they're going to cover it up. They're going to hide it so that he looks like every other reindeer and he can go play reindeer games um, and he doesn't have to, he doesn't, so he doesn't have to fear being different <clears throat> and they don't have to answer questions about him being different. So like smudge up his nose and make it all dark like every other reindeer so it doesn't look all bright and shiny and like a big flaming beacon of um, redness like disco balls, like gayness, like those things that we associate with people who um, fit in a queer space, that unknown, those things that are odd, off, or just not expected uh, of the norm of what we think should be. When we talk about gender, masculinity, femininity, um, all, all the societal norms that we put on people about who they have to be. Hey, how are you doing? Sla What's going on, Teresa? So um, when he's born and he has that bright red nose and his parents covered up, there was no P flag, right? There was no like reindeer parent support group for reindeers that were different and special and um, kind of amazing with their red noses. So uh, they didn't know. They didn't know what to do. All they knew is that they had a, this child that was different. How are you? And they had to do something about it. And so they, they covered it up and they, they hid it. And they taught him to hide his nose and his ability and his power and his, um, his um, specialness. And he learned to have shame about it. Um, he, right? Yeah, we're, none of us are the only misfit. And he learned to have shame about it and he learned to hide it. And he, um, I am, what's going on? You got plans for, for the holiday? Are you traveling or are you staying home? So, so Rudolph, as a lot of queer kids, uh, is taught by the society that's around them. It's taught by the parents that they have. Just, um... Just like I experienced before I came out, we, we see all these things around us that tell us you're different, you're not normal, and you need to fit in. Um, and it's greater than just being like someone who's left-handed. I'm left-handed. A lot of people I know are right-handed. Ooh, babysitting. Sorry about it. Uh, <clears throat> but then there are some people who are like great at sports and some people who are uh, like football. Some people who are good at track. Some people who are good at dancing. Some people who are good at theater. And we all have these special skills, and when we're talking about queer kids, they're um, in this invisible minority of kids who 
recognized throughout media, TV, and um, the images that they're presented in in paper material, on computer screens, in the TV shows that they watch, they're presented with all of these cis heterosexual relationships. Aren't we fucking all? <laughs> Aren't we all? And so these queer kids are like, wait, where am I? And there are more images now. There's more visibility now than when I was coming up, but it's still there. There's still this like, oh, wait, I need to be like this thing or I need to be like my parents or I want to be like my parents because I see my parents as the model of who I'm supposed to be. And it creates this like scratched record for those of you who remember records. <laughs> it creates this schism of of um, abnormality of what's different about me what, that I don't see uh, myself in who I'm trying to model. And as I'm trying to model them, you're realizing, wait, this isn't who I am, but I don't know who I am or where I'm supposed to be or how I'm supposed to be or why things are different. And then puberty hits and all hell breaks loose. Just like fucking Rudolph, there's a point where like in the in the cartoon of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, he's got this black cap on his nose. And there's a point where they're playing around, horsing around, and the black cap falls off. And right? And good group too, by the way. And the um and his nose is there, shining bright. And there's always those moments where, hey Wrigley, where our noses end up shining. Hey Gideon, our noses end up shining unexpectedly. And those are the moments you fear, like someone's gonna discover you if you haven't come out first. Uh, and it's also those moments that people who have already come out fear every time they're in a new situation, that their their gayness is gonna glow, their queerness is gonna appear, uh, their red noses are gonna shine because when you're in that space, you don't know how people are going to respond to your big shiny nose. You don't know um, if people are going to um, treat you the same way you were treated or have seen others treated when you were um, in, when you were young, when you were in grade school, all those, those traumatic experiences that come back. You're like, wow, am I going to be accepted when I say this? But now there's greater consequence because especially if you're in an employment situation, now you have the potential to not get hired, which means you don't have a job, which means you can't pay your rent, which means you don't uh, eat, which means you don't have a place to live, all of those things. You can't survive. Uh, and there are still uh, states that can fire you and can discriminate against you for being gay in the workplace or queer or trans. Um, anything that uh, doesn't identify with uh, the cis heteronormative in our world. Um, so those moments when our noses glow, when those little black things pop off and suddenly we're shown for who we are, are scary moments. And it, you never know when it's gonna happen. It's freaky. Uh, and so Rudolph's story from the moment he's born is we're waiting for him to come out of the closet about his big red nose. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. If you're celebrating the solstice, happy solstice, happy Yule, all the things, all the happies. Uh, good, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad I got to see you. Um, so the, the, um, the experience of shame, and fear of coming out is encapsulated in Rudolph's little mini story of being this young misfit who uh, is taught to hide, who is taught to be shameful, who is taught to diminish, who is taught to um, acknowledge that his parents don't see him as a full or recognize him as a full um, member of the reindeer family, that there's something wrong with him. Uh, and then he, and then he starts to meet after, after his thing falls off, you know, his, that cover, hey Melly, after that cover falls off and he is forced to come out, just like say, accidentally saying something like, uh, yeah, we went out this weekend. Oh, who's we? Oh, now I have to tell you who we is and that could change our relationship and I fear that. Um, 
So at that point, his, his little nose pops off and he's come out. And there's no, you can't like put the, the cover back on your nose. Like once you've come out, you've come out. However, you haven't come out to everybody. Not everybody knows you got a big bright red nose until you get in front of them and you, you like show them your big bright red nose. And there are some people who we know um, just because our society is visual, you'll look at someone and go, oh, they have characteristics that remind me of someone who's gay, or they have a sound or a tone that reminds me of someone who's gay, or they dress and look like someone who I identify uh, as being gay. And so we make these quick associations. It's a survival technique. You can't not do it. It's out there. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're right. So... Uh, when appropriate, it's always a, it's always fair to ask. If you don't know the person, then leave them the fuck alone. But uh, once it's out there, it's out there. And so once you're when you're you're out of the closet, you're out of the closet. The question is, what situation are you in next that brings you out of the closet uh, in the future? So Rudolph's little nose falls out off. He's off. He's out of the closet. He um, happens to also while he runs away which a lot of young queer kids do, they run away um, or they run away in their 20s. And by run away, I don't necessarily mean completely run away, but sometimes they'll be kicked out of their house. Sometimes they'll be forced out of their house. Sometimes they'll leave the house because it's unsafe, unhealthy. Um, sometimes uh, they will choose to leave the house because they are um, looking for something they can't get at home. And then as you age and get into your like late late teens, early 20s, and you go to college, then you are in fact leaving home. And so this, this story of Rudolph leaving uh, your mentor's partner ran right away when, uh, when they were younger. Um, so Rudolph epitomizes this. He runs away or he leaves his home in order to find who he's meant to be, other people like him, because he doesn't feel like he can get that at home. And he's still experiencing the shame of his parents. He's still experiencing the shame of uh, the the people, the family that is around him. Yes, when he came, so he he left when he came out, and did he leave for a larger city? So I think it's interesting that Rudolph goes to the island of misfit toys, um, because to me that's kind of like a city. It's kind of like going in San Francisco when all of you know. When you're a young queer kid, you hear about San Francisco and you hear about New York and you go to one of those two cities. Because uh, it's just what you hear about in media, in song, in uh, when you hear about Castro, when you hear about gay rights, when you hear about Harvey Milk, you uh, when you hear about um, Stonewall, when you hear about... Uh, pride parades, when you hear about activism, it's in these places. And so you go to where you think the other queer people are so you can find your family, this, these islands of misfit toys. And when you get there and you, <laughs> you realize that, wait, uh, I'm still not, like I'm kind of a part of this, but I don't know, I still don't know where I fit. Um, that's even more... I think even more traumatic because now you got to try and fit in all these other spaces. Now you got to fit in um, the echelon of within the queer community, the echelon of race, age, and type. So race is a very clear and present danger in the queer community, um, and is is starting starting to be addressed but still not fully being addressed um we've got uh, health issues that come with stigma we've got um i use gender neutral pronouns yeah we yes we all did that didn't we? i think a lot of us did that um and didn't realize we may have realized we were doing it purposely and then it became part of our speech and it became part of how we speak to say, oh, well, they, or um, sometimes we'll drop the we and we'll just say me or, uh, and we'll drop the us. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, and you know what? That's where she came from. That's where the she stuff came from in the 70s, 60s, probably earlier than that. 
she came about so when you were talking in the bar about your significant other, you'd call them she, so no one knew that you were talking about him. Uh, but she then became camp and started being uh, a part of the culture. So we all look at her. Uh, but it, it was actually a survival technique at one time, and then it became owned. Anyway, um, so you get into this island of misfit toys. We've got race problems. We've got health and wellness stigma, uh, mental health stigma. We've got um, um, type. So just like just like popularity in high school, we've got these types. There's the jock types. There's the otters. There's the bears. There's the chickens. There's the twinks. There's the um, daddies. There's the um, in between daddies and bears that nobody really I think has a name for. There's wolves. There's cubs. There's all these things. There's the club kids. There's the um, you know old guys who hang out at the strip clubs. Hey, pissed off. Um, so we got all these these groups. And then you have to decide where you fit in there. So now you're fitting within race, class, culture, and and what you look like. Um, it is incredibly confusing. It's really frustrating. It is secondarily traumatic trauma, like compared to where you just left, where you were being shamed, told to hide, didn't know how to react to other people, were. Uh, being teased, bullied, uh, and not given the tools you needed to survive and be strong and, and handle what's being thrown at you. Now you're, now you're, who you thought was your chosen family is um, giving you like a whole nother whirlwind of well, who the fuck am I and how do I fit in here? Um, hang on, I'm fixing my battery. I didn't hear it go on, but let's see. I think, anyway. Um, oh yeah, it's on. So Island of Misfit Toys, it's the, the big abominable, the abominable is all that other shit that you gotta deal with. It's the, it's the stuff on your back that you add to yourself that, that your own community throws at you. Um, that's the big abominable. I don't think they call him the snowman in Rudolph, but he's the abominable. Um, Yeah, isn't he in this one? Because the wizard, I don't remember who, anyway. Um, yeah, that's Santa Claus is coming to town with the wizard. So now, now we're at the state of who am I, where do I belong? And Herbie's been along for the ride. At least he found a little buddy. I think Herbie's like a big leather dom top, which is a whole nother group. He just, he started off as not knowing who he was, and then once he figured out, yes, I want to be a dentist, and I'm going to make that shit happen, uh, then that became, you know, he turned into this, I, I think that's what happened to him. He's got a harness underneath that little thing, and when, you know, he'll take that hat off, and next thing you know, he's in, somebody's in a sling, and he's in charge. <laughs> Herbie is Herbie is one of my favorite characters because he he like Rudolph goes through this transition of not knowing who he was or where he's meant to be and then suddenly he's like I'm a fucking dentist I'm gonna make that shit happen and Rudolph after he gets to the island of misfit toys realizes there are other people who need him there are people who need him to guide, there are people who need him to lead, and and he's able to do that. And he's like, let's go home and make some shit happen. And they go home and suddenly realize that his superpower that he was so mocked for, this this thing that uh, other other reindeer couldn't handle, this thing that other um, that even Santa couldn't handle, the the powers that be didn't know what to do with. Uh, suddenly needed him for who he was and what he brought to the table. And I think that is a queer journey that uh, any anybody who fits under this queer umbrella will recognize is all of that, all of that um, repression, all of that um, shame, all of that 
those moments where we come out inadvertently and we come out purposely, those moments where we look for chosen family, those moments where we discover that even our chosen family has problems and their own trauma, uh, and that we're, we're building something to help us survive, uh, and we're all looking for a way to fit in at the same time, but what, what makes us special makes us strong, uh, and that's pretty powerful. Am I saying that gay people are special simply because they're gay? Fuck yeah. Yeah, I'm saying that's a superpower. Being Going through the events of your life when you're a gay person, uh, I'm uh, assuming you're not. Are you, are you a, a gay person, Redneck? Or do you identify as queer, gay, bisexual, non-binary, any of that stuff? Uh, yeah, it beca because we learn these survival techniques, we learn these ways to manage our lives. It's literally a sexual preference that doesn't make you special. Oh, well, what do you think makes someone special, Redneck? Because all of those events teach us how to, how to, personality. Okay, so... I do think that, it, so this is part of what I was getting to next, is that I think all of those events, especially for queer kids, gets you to the point of um, creating skill sets that will take you further uh, if you recognize what those skill sets are. Personality makes you a different person than all the, I, I agree, personality, everybody's personality is different, 100%. Um, but so is everyone's sexuality. Sexuality is a scale. N no one's 100%. I mean, there's got to be someone who's 100% straight, and there's got to be someone who's 100% gay, and everybody else falls in between. Uh, and I agree, you can, you can go through all those things without being gay. It's true. But I think that the gay experience, the queer experience, because um, I think that umbrella is broader than just gay, when you go through that experience, it is a lived and shared experience that we can also equate to this story of Rudolph, which is why I'm comparing it, because Rudolph goes through a lot of the same um, trajectory. Um, Rudolph goes through the same stages of um, shame, trauma, uh, acceptance, coming out, fear, chosen family, um, and then finally realizing that everything that he's experienced through his entire life has led him to this moment where what people literally shamed him for was what made him special. I agree. We're, we're saying the same thing. I'm just saying that people who have, you came out as an atheist to your Southern Baptist family. I agree. I'm just using Rudolph and the, the queer trajectory as a comparison so that I can, like you, give people something else to hang on to and say, oh, I recognize this experience. Just like you're saying, uh, coming out to a Southern Baptist as an atheist, that's a lot, that's heavy. I agree, there's nothing easy about that experience. Uh, and. And I'm sure that you experienced a very similar trajectory of um, feeling like you at some point had to hide who you were and how you felt. Shame about where you are uh, when you started discovering this about yourself. And then the fear of having to come out and finally doing it. Hey, Sly. I mean, that's heavy. That's a lot. And then, and then finding that chosen atheist family. Queer people are special simply because they're queer. Oh, your point is that queer people are not special simply because they're queer, but they're special because of who they are. Yeah, got it. And see, I, I don't think I can agree. I, I completely understand the point you're making. I don't think I can agree with that personally because that shaped who I am and it shaped my personality. So the, the queerness of me is special. The queerness of me helped create all of the things that I am, and it's a part of who I am. So I disagree. I think that queerness is like that red nose on Rudolph. And I would say the same thing about your atheism. I think that that atheism is that red nose. That's the special thing. That's the superpower that 
uh, helped create and mold who you are today. Thanks, Sly. But I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I don't think either of us is wrong. I just, I think we come at it from different points of view. And so I, I think it's interesting. Yeah, I, I can appreciate what you're saying. Cause I, I've thought about the same thing. I've tried to like understand, do I think it's this? Do I think the same way you do? Uh, and I honestly do, Sorry, I hear some of our ferrets arguing. We've got we've got ferrets and we've got visiting ferrets right now, so we're house or we're ferret sitting for five extra ferrets, and sometimes there's some arguments that have been breaking out as they as they remember who each other are and if they're actually supposed to get along and who's in their territory and who's not, and they're not interacting at all. That, um, but sometimes when they're near each other. Um, of the ones that are ours that live here, they'll get in arguments with their their cage mates who happen to be near the other ones, thinking that they're in the way and causing some territorial disputes. And anyway, it's ferrets. <laughs> it's just, it's animals trying to figure out how to get along. Thanks, Redneck. Um, I agree, and I, I at least, I at least try and, from my perspective, I at least try and hear what people say when they come in here, because one, I, I know I'm building a channel that has coming out in the name. I know I'm putting something like queer or gay uh, in my title. I know that I've got a rainbow flag in there. And sometimes people come in here and they come in like guns cocked and, it's, I think it's disarming when I go, wait, let me listen to you because I, um, I come from a space where things aren't totally understood all the time. So I'd rather at least have a conversation about what you have to say, uh, before I decide to block you for being a jerk, you know, cause not, not everybody's coming in being a jerk and not everything is understood through text. So at least we can try and be open to hear what each other has to say. And it's, um, I agree with you. I think there's some people who are so quick to like pull the trigger that they miss that there could have been a great conversation. They might've learned something different or they might, um, or they might uh, disagree and that that's okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I have to admit, when I saw your name, I was like, oh shit, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I don't know if I'm ready for what's about to come in and go down in this room. Uh, my, uh, my whole family, though, like the family I was raised with, we're from Oregon, pretty rural Oregon. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I do agree. It's really easy to say you're open. Um, but a lot of times that means you're only open to things that you think are the right things instead of listening to another person's opinion or idea. Yeah. So, uh, I come from a space where views are very different than mine, but I was raised with a lot of those. So I understand them and I've had a chance to think, learn and grow, um, uh, and, and form my own opinions, but I still understand the fundamentals of why those are there. I mean, I, I get um, why some things are the way they are and why some people know what they know. So, oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a triggering name, the pissed off redneck. It sounds like you're going to come in here and be a, be an asshole, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I was like, all right, let's, let's see what happens. Uh, I mean, my, my dad walks around with a hat up this high, you know, that baseball cap only comes up this high. It doesn't come all the way down here. So, uh, and, and my nephew the same way. So I, I understand, I understand, um, a different point of view. It's kind of like, um, and I'm not, I don't want to get into this right now. This will be a whole nother conversation cause I can't stay much longer. Um, but just the entire topic of gun control is something that I love to have conversations about. Not here, not right now. Um, 
I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, rural South, you're a classical liberal and an atheist. That's incredible. <laughs> Or just maybe you do, because sometimes, I mean, sometimes that inner redneck in me is still there. Like, there are parts of it. You should try Brexit. <laughs> yeah. I don't know enough about Brexit to lead or host a conversation. I might learn a few things, but uh, I would rather be a part of another hosted conversation around Brexit where I could share some ideas and think and, and type uh, instead of hosting one. Because I, I just, I'm not in it enough. I also, so, um, just briefly, actually, we, we, you don't know, we may, we might not even debate, or if we did, it'd be interesting to know what, if we had different, like, where our opinions sat. Uh, my dad, my family, my immediate family, so I was raised uh, in a hunting family, so all the meat in our table came from deer and elk, uh, so there were always guns in our house. The... Um, house that I live in today, my husband is a cop. And so there are guns in our house. Uh, I am, uh, I am exposed to trained with and, um, understand the use of guns. And I have a lot of thoughts on it, but I don't want to talk about it. Right. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do another scope on that soon. Cause I do think it's an interesting experience. I think it's, um, a good conversation to have. I don't think enough people talk about it. And as someone like you, who was born in a very rural area, uh, who is now in a city, there are so different perspectives on guns in the city versus being in a rural community. So it's fascinating. Yeah, right. I have to just, I'm like, do I really want to do that now? I mean, I've opened up the door. So uh, it might be interesting to have a conversation about it, uh, especially having the perspectives that we all do. Uh, and, and where I you know, right, where I work, I work for a nonprofit that um, isn't invested in gun control, but we're exposed to the the um, outcomes of the gun conversation because I live in Chicago. So we're exposed to a lot of conversations about guns in Chicago and police activity. Uh, so the whole thing is very near and dear to my heart. But uh, he shot BBs at dogs that pooped in your yard. Oh my God. Yeah, we used to... Um, or at least my dad would, he'd pop the cats that came in our yard that were stray cats. He'd pop them in the ass and they'd scream and run away. They, I accidentally shot my sister with a BB. I hit, I hit a tree stump and the BB ricocheted and hit her in the ass and she had a big bruise for a while. That's a bruise from BB. Yeah, my nephew's got a um, a conceal, not a conceal, is it? I think Oregon's open carry. Anyway, he's got his license, and Steve, my husband, has his license. Anyway, so yeah, um... This has been an interesting conversation. Thank you all for being here and for joining in. I really appreciate it. Uh, I will consider having this gun control conversation. Um, yeah, I know it's hard, right? I we, That's why I was like, I need to shut this down because I also have to leave to go to my mother-in-law's. So uh, thanks for listening to my Rudolph story comparison. I, um, I really appreciate it. I was just thinking about it. I was like, I need to talk about this and then just kind of work out where my brain is and what it's thinking. And, and I really appreciate um, challenging viewpoints where we got to think about it in another way as well. I'm, I'm probably going to write about this later too. So yeah, right?
Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope, I hope you guys all have a great, um, a great Thursday. Tomorrow is Friday, which means I'll be here at 6 p.m. Central in order to do readings for folks. I get on at 6 p.m. Central. Good to talk to you too, pissed off. Um, I get on at 6 p.m. Central where I'll do readings for folks via donation. So if you're interested, come join me at 6 o'clock p.m. And uh, hang out or join in the fun if you want. So I will talk to you. I just followed you uh, also pissed. I'm going to go check out some of your previous scopes. YouTube Gideon, see you later. Good night.